You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have uh, Professor Kevin Moore, who's a professor of uh, hepatology. He's at uh, one of London's, he is one of London's uh, leading and most reputable liver specialists. He's, uh, again, professor of hepatology, hepatology at University College London, and he sees and treats all kinds of uh, liver disease at the Royal Free London Foundation Trust. And also he's worked um, as a part of the liver transplant team, uh, which uh, deals with cirrhosis complications. So, uh, Professor Moore, or a.k.a. Kevin, if it's okay, uh, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Okay, fine. How are yeah. you? Very good. Uh, tell me, what got you interested in, uh, in particular, the liver, you know, many years ago? Gosh, uh, it takes me back. Um, I suppose about 30 years ago or so, I was actually planning to do endocrinology. And for various just reasons, I ended up working as the liver registrar at King's College Hospital which was one of the busiest liver units in Europe. Um, and I just, got, I just got interested in looking after liver patients. And then when they offered me a, a research fellowship, you know, with no strings attached almost without me having to seek funding, in the end, the offer was too good to be true, so I just accepted it. And then this really went on from there. Okay. So you, and after all these years, uh, does the liver and its condition still fascinate you? Um I don't think that's the word fascinate is the right word, but it's always interesting. You know, it's just one, it's one of those specialties that I've, it, it's interesting in, in that you have a diversity of patients. You know, some areas, it seems to me in some areas, some specialties, there's a much more limited number of um, diseases that one tends to see. Um, but I suspect probably pulmonologists have the same view of hepatologists as hepatologists have a pulmonologist. So it works both ways. It's just what whatever interests you and you kind of fall into with you, I guess. Okay. So what are some things that you've seen and learned about liver function that the public probably never thinks about or doesn't know about? I suppose one thing I would say is is that, you know, it's becoming increasingly common to give patients access to all of their liver function test results or all of their blood results, regardless of whether they're liver function tests. And a lot of patients will look at a number, like say an ALT, let's say it's, for example, 30, and then the next week it's say 28, and they'll say it's gone down. And you say, well, technically it has gone down from 30 to 28. But of course, these numbers tend to just fluctuate. They fluctuate throughout the day. They fluctuate from day to day. And actually, all results tend to go up or go down, just depending on you know, the, the, the the weather, the mood, the whatever, you know, all sorts of reasons. And so um, a lot of patients end up watching and thinking that things have got worse or things have got better. But actually, they're not. They're just fluctuating around a norm, really. Um, I suppose that's one thing, I suppose, is, is something that most people in the public don't really think about. Um, the other thing is that the yellowness of the eyes, that's when people get jaundice, which you don't often see as a member of the public. But, but the, the, you, there are some people who have a condition called Gilbert's or Gilbert's, uh, which affects about 1 in 20 to 1 in 10 of the general population. And and they just have slightly high bilirubin levels, so they tend to be slightly yellow, particularly if they've not eaten or if they've been ill. Um, mm. and, and that's quite a common condition, which doesn't is pretty harmless as it happens. But um, I mention it just because there will be people in your audience who will have Gilbert's. Okay. What are some of the um, liver complications that are pretty common that you see people come in with, and you know what what are the conditions called, and what happens? Well, the most common conditions that we see generally are patients with 
um, either abnormal liver function tests, of which the most common cause is either alcohol or fatty liver disease. Now, fatty liver disease is very common. It affects about one in five adults in the USA, uh, as well as Europe. And it's caused primarily by being overweight. Uh, it's also caused or associated with type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome. But it's also caused, um, importantly, by alcohol. Because when you drink alcohol, alcohol is absorbed in the intestine. It goes to the liver. And in the liver, it's metabolized to fat, basically. So if you drink a lot of booze, that booze will be metabolized to fat. And that fat will be deposited in the liver. And, of course, elsewhere, which is why people... They drink a lot of beer. They have a beer belly, for example. Eat. So when the liver creates fat, that's called what de novo lipogenesis, a new creation of fat. Yes, yeah. Of course, the fat the, the liver is, is important in lipogenesis. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So what, what does the liver use to create fat? And you know, once it does, does that fat just stay in the liver, or does it go to certain parts of the body to certain cells? No, the, the liver will export fat in there, there are circulating particles, which will be deposited will go elsewhere in the body. Um, I can't, I can't pretend to be an expert on lipid transport, but uh, I mean, certainly the liver is involved in, in certainly synthesis of uh, what we call VLDL and the LDL. And, um, you know, some patients who have abnormalities of the LDL receptor can get very significant hyper. Lipidemia or hypercholesterolemia, and they end up with heart attacks at a very young age. And in fact, one of the treatments for that is occasionally liver transplantation because that ultimately is the, um, uh, a form of gene therapy. You know, if you've got an abnormal gene in the liver that needs to be replaced, if you put a new liver in it, it will function normally. Uh, that's a rather extreme example, but that has been done many times before. So you've observed that what fatty liver disease is is it on the rise for the past uh, you know ten twenty years? Yeah, if you go back twenty years ago, we we didn't really talk about it very much. Uh, I think we were aware of it, but fatty liver has been increasing dramatically, um, both in terms of its its frequency, its recognition, the recognition that. Um, a significant proportion of patients with fatty liver disease will get steatohepatitis or inflammation of the liver and go on to develop cirrhosis. So, for example, if you had fatty liver, um, the chances are the fat would just be causing what we call simple steatosis, the fat would simply sit in the liver. It may cause abnormal liver tests, but it doesn't really cause much liver damage. On the other hand, if the liver, if you're what, the one in 20 people or 15 20% of people with fatty liver that develops what we call steatohepatitis, that's inflammation of the liver caused by fat, then that low-grade inflammation will lead to scarring over the long term. And I often give this analogy to my patients. Imagine you have a pin and you prick your thumb just once a day, every day. After a month, you'll have about 28 pin pricks. And some will have healed, some will still be a bit sore. Yes, I might be a little bit red in places, but so what? If you pick it every day for a year, um, parts of the, the thumb will be quite reddened and other bits will probably have some early scarring. But if you stop pricking your thumb then, your thumb would probably recover. If you prick your thumb every day for 20 years, by the end of 20 years, your thumb's going to look a mess. Mm. And people get that. It's a, and that's a bit like what happens with fatty liver disease. You have a fat deposition in the liver. It causes a tiny bit of inflammation, which on a day-to-day basis is neither here nor there. But over a long period of time, it can create major problems and leading to cirrhosis, liver cancer, and liver failure. So, you mm-hmm. know, indeed, just today I saw a patient with fatty liver disease due to diabetes who had liver cancer and had it resected and and he developed recurrent liver cancer, and so we've now listed him for liver transplantation. So it's an important, you know, it's an important disease. It's not a, uh, a disease that can be ignored, which is what a lot of doctors used to think, because it is, can be quite serious. So why do you think so many people are turning their liver into foie gras? Why do you, what's causing it? So I didn't understand your question. Oh, what do you think is the cause of uh, fatty liver disease? I made a joke and said they're turning into foie gras, you know, the, the, right. the duck, yeah, yeah. duck goose. Yeah, no, 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 no. Okay. 
Well, the, the, I mean, most people, you know, who've got who have fatty liver disease, it's because they're overweight or they have type two diabetes. And if you have type two diabetes and are overweight, what your listeners need to know is if you go out and exercise and lose weight and exercise vigorously three or four times a week and lose maybe seven percent of your body weight, you'll find that actually, firstly, the fatty liver will disappear and resolve, and secondly, your type two diabetes may disappear as well. So, you know, there's hope for those with with type 2 diabetes and fatty liver, and it's called exercise and weight loss. Um, And I know there'll be some people saying, I can't exercise. Well, if you're sitting on a sofa, you can probably pick up tins of baked beans and do arm raises, and that's a form of exercise. And and that will, although probably not as effective as doing a proper workout in the gym, will still have an impact. And Likewise, the idea that some people, you know, say they can't lose weight, they only eat half a lettuce leaf a day, uh, and they're still putting on weight, is simply not true. It's not, you know, thermodynamically, it's not possible. So, you know, if you eat less, you will lose weight, no doubt about that. Are there any uh, medications that have come out to treat, uh, I think they call it NAFLD, right? Non-alcoholic. Well, yeah, um, some people put it in NAFLD, which is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I, I prefer the term fatty liver because whether it's due to alcohol. I mean, obviously, if it's due to alcohol, you need to stop drinking. Um, but um, is your question, are there any drugs to treat fatty liver? Um, right. I've heard that some drugs may be out or coming. Have you seen any of this? There are, num- there are a number of drugs that are being developed who, who may hope to launch for the treatment of fatty liver disease. Um, at the moment, the only drug that we know reduces the rate of fibrosis uh, under following meta-analysis is a drug called pioglitazone, which is a drug used for type 2 diabetes. Um, when it was first published some years ago, many of us were rather skeptical and didn't prescribe it. But there have been a number of studies now, and the recent meta-analysis says yes, it reduces the risk of fibrosis by about threefold. And the other treatment that, that that's not licensed, but um, I think if I had fibrosis from liver disease, fatty liver, I'd take it, is vitamin E, 800 units a day. Again, it reduces the risk of fibrosis by about twofold. Um, so there are two simple drugs that are currently on the market that can be used currently. And then there's studies looking at beta-colic acid, which is the drug that's been licensed for the treatment of primary biliary cholangitis. Um, but I don't know, I'll be honest with you, I don't know enough about the data on that using the drug obitacolic acid in fatty liver. And then there are a number of other drugs that have been tri- or tried or, or being trialed, uh, but I don't know their data either. Are there any, um, you, know, you mentioned exercise, are there any specific dietary interventions or plans that you've observed that uh, people can do to help themselves. Okay, so in terms of the diet, if you if you have fatty liver and you want to go on a diet to improve fatty liver, uh, most of your listeners will think, oh, well, you just need to reduce the amount of fat in your diet. No, you need to reduce the amount of sugar, carbohydrate in your diet. It's a low carbohydrate diet that improves fatty liver disease. That means no sugary things, no cakes, no sweets, no breads, no pastas, no potatoes no rice and and really trying to keep the amount of carbohydrate you know you that you eat to a bare minimum of course you will have carbohydrate in some of the foods that you eat that's fine um and again if you're eating carbohydrate there are different forms of carbohydrate so if you for example should you have brown rice rather than white rice mm-hmm. yes you should and the reason being is that things like brown rice are less processed and that means that the body has to work harder to digest the carbohydrate that's there compared to, you know, like white rice or white sugar. It just, you know, white rice is being, it's like partially purified. So the body just has to do less work to digest it, is my understanding. It's rather simplistic way of looking at it, but I think that's roughly right. Um, but, but, you know, just keep the carbohydrates to the minimum. And that means little okay. things like, say, if you're going to have chili con carne with rice, you, you might have a spoonful of rice rather than a cupful or a couple of cupfuls of rice. And, of course, you, know, you can eat you know, the chili con carne mince meat you know, with sour cream or cheese or whatever with very little rice, and it still can be quite nice. It's just about changing your habit, uh, and that will 
have a major impact on your um, insulin resistance, any type 2 diabetes that you have, and your fatty liver. Okay. Uh, what, this is more of a basic question, but what role does the liver play in typical digestion? What is it doing versus the stomach, for instance? Well, when we eat, um, as you know, all your food goes down, your food pipe goes into your stomach, the stomach churns over, it acts a bit like a, a bit like a, a meat mincer, really. You know, in the old meat mincers where you, if you remember, you could put meat into a thing and you turn it around and it would kind of mince it up. It's a bit like that in the stomach. It, and it also adds in, makes it more acidic, adds certain digestive enzymes. And then as the food passes down into the into the and the and the upper jejunum, it starts to become absorbed. And uh, the food, as it's absorbed um, across the intestinal wall, it, it, the absorbed nutrients are picked up um, in the venous. In the so blood flows into the intestines, and the venous blood, as it leaves, which is the blood carrying, which are the veins carrying the blood that leaves the intestine, contain all these nutrients that you've absorbed. Okay. And where do those nutrients go? Well, the nutrients all converge into the portal vein, which goes directly into the liver. So basically everything you eat before it goes anywhere else goes through your liver. And your liver will look up look up stuff that you've eaten and, and remove the, the bad things. So if you absorb, you know, eating, if you've taken a whole series of tablets, for example, the liver may start um, will we'll just metabolize some of those drugs. And some of that will happen very rapidly. And that's called first pass metabolism. And other drugs will be partially metabolized and then keep circulating around while the liver continues to metabolize. Um, it will t- take certain things up, like the alcohol will be taken up, metabolized to fat. Uh, drugs will be metabolized. Um, some of the foods will be stored as nu- some nutrients will be stored in the liver and others will just circulate. Um, after passing through the liver. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, okay, so liver may take uh, something it deems uh, troublesome and turn it into fat, or it may yeah. uh, cause a yeah, it will, it will and, and create a metabolite. It's, it's, yeah, it's a bit like a, 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 a water filter, you know, it's like a filtration unit and removes things, stores things, but it also makes things as well. I guess it stores, modifies... And, and the other thing, of course, is that, is that the liver also produces bile. And bile um, is a bit like detergent. So the bile goes into the intestine. Bile is the, stuff, the yellow stuff that makes your poo go brown. And bile in the intestine helps to digest fat. So if, if, so that's that's what that does. So, so the, the liver also helps in the digestion of various fats. Okay. okay. And then what happens with, uh, with cirrhosis? With... What does the condition look like? What's happened to the liver? So cirrhosis is the end result of that repetitive inflammation scan of the liver that I described with fatty liver disease and the pinprick every day. So if you drink alcohol excessively, or you have a fatty liver, or if you have chronic viral hepatitis, each of those processes acts a bit like a pinprick every day. And over many years, the liver can be chronically damaged, chronically scarred, and then, knowing does it lay down lots of scar tissue, the liver, which everyone knows is an organ which tries to regenerate itself, tries to regenerate itself, and it grows through these what they call regenerative nodules. So you end up with regenerative nodules scarring, and ultimately the scarring and regenerative nodules blocks the normal flow of blood through the liver, um, which upsets quite a lot of processes. Uh, it, the replacement of normal tissue by Damaged cells and fibrosis leads to loss of function. And so, you know, you end up with liver failure and high pressures in different veins, uh, within the liver. So, so the blood that leaves the intestine that normally would flow through the liver seamlessly while being, having all the nasties removed suddenly finds it can't pass through the liver properly and has to bypass it and bypass it to other parts of the body. When it does that, it causes a condition called hepatic encephalopathy, which is caused by toxins in the blood that bypass the liver because they can't get through the liver because of all this scarring and regen- scarring tissue and regenerative modules. And those, when that blood bypasses the liver and goes to the brain, 
where it causes mental confusion or fogging, otherwise called apathic encephalopathy. So that's, that's the sort of end, end stage consequences. I hope that's clear. Hmm. Is there a, a dialysis that can be done that emulates liver function and filtering, or is that not available? Well, it's, well, it's a holy grail. Lots of people are working on it, but currently it's not available. Hmm. Okay. And when the liver uh, regenerates, does it regenerate in a healthy way or does it regenerate in a scarred, you know, fibrotic no, gen- way? Gen- gen- generally it- speaking, if, if, if I was to remove half of your liver, I don't know how long it takes, but it's like four months or something, it would grow back again. In, in a healthy way where it would function properly? I think so. Do you know what? I don't know. If, I, if I'm really honest, I don't really know. I think it's meant to be in a healthy way, but does it look completely normal? You know, I don't know. I don't really know. Uh, but certainly the function's hmm. normal. Hmm. So I guess, you know, if someone, for instance, is an alcoholic and they stop the insult, they stop having alcohol, do they tend to, you know, regrow their livers and heal? Or is there a certain point of no return? And what characterizes yeah. uh, the point uh, of that, no return that's if there is one? That's it, exactly. So, for example, if let's say, for example, you were, uh, I suppose in the States, you use the term alcoholic a lot. We often use the word alcohol dependent, but it's our politically correct way of saying alcoholic. But let's say you're an alcoholic and you've caused lots of scarring of the liver, but not yet quite cirrhosis. Let's say you've got 90% or you're 90% on the way to having cirrhosis. If you were to stop drinking, uh, providing you didn't have any major complications, then over the next 12 to 18 months, your liver would start to recover and all of the scarring would start to regress back towards normal. If you were then starting to drink again, probably your liver injury would be accelerate, occur at an accelerated rate. Um, and and the, I can come on to the reasons why that might be later. On the other hand, um, mm. if, you've been, if you've been carrying on drinking and you've developed cirrhosis and you suddenly stop, providing you don't, you know, you've not gone too far, your liver will continue to improve over the next 12 to 18 months. And you'll end up with quiescent, stable cirrhosis and that can stay stable for many 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 years you have a small risk of about two percent per year of developing liver cancer um but otherwise and, and you may develop high pressure in the portal veins and have what we call portal hypertension uh but i've seen patients i've got patients now i've been seeing them now for over 20 years who stopped drinking over 20 years ago and they're still alive and well. It's amazing how much you can live can turn around and improve. On the other hand, some patients have just pushed the liver too far and you know the, the, and the liver's just gone a bit over the edge and can't quite fully recover. Um and then it's difficult because we don't offer liver transplantation to people who haven't been abstinent. So usually about a year, to be honest with you. I mean, the rules mm. tend to say six months. But, you know, if someone's been in hospital for six months, it doesn't really count. You don't know whether they can stay off the booze for six months on their own. So uh, these are the sorts of things that, that complicate those sorts of assessments. So uh, they tend not to do so well. Yeah. So what are, what are some of the markers that uh, you can look at? and What do the markers mean? And how do they tell you that, the, you know, the functioning of the liver? What are some examples, the uh, most important markers? Well, we, 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 we often measure what we call liver function tests, um, which is interesting because they're not actually liver function tests. They're really liver damage tests because they don't really reflect how good the liver is functioning to a large extent. So we often measure liver enzymes, and there are two enzymes in the States. They're called SGPT and SGOT, that's serum glutamate pyruvate transferase or serum uh, glutamate oxoacetate transferase, and in Europe we call those ALT and AST respectively. And there are liver enzymes that are increased with liver damage. Um, there are other enzymes that we measure, such as alkaline phosphatase, we measure gamma GT, uh, we also measure serum albumin, and blood clotting, such as protomentine. And the protomentine is actually a measure of function rather than liver damage. Uh, but the other tests tend to be well, with the exception of albumin, um, tend to be tests of damage rather than function. Liver albumin, I'm sorry, rather, serum albumin can be 
a biomarker of liver damage, but it can also go down with even just fe- infections. So if you came into hospital with pneumonia, your blood album would drop because the as part of the acute phase response, as liver switches off the production of albumin uh, to preserve itself to fight infections. So I'm not sure if I've answered your question, except to say that there are various tests that we do to look at liver function. There are various biomarkers that we use to look at for alcohol use. I don't know if you want me to mention those. Um, sure, yeah, if you would briefly, yeah. The, yeah. So one of the biomarkers that people you sometimes use is measuring carbohydrate deficient transferrin, um, which in my experience it isn't actually very good. Uh, it's a serum biomarker. It reflects alcohol consumption over about the previous week. Um, gamma GT, which is what most physicians think of as an excellent biomarker for alcohol, is actually a useless biomarker for alcohol. It only goes up in about 50% of patients who you would deem to be alcoholic or alcohol dependent. Uh, and the other half is completely normal. So it's not really very good. Um, the other test that's being used much more in Europe, I think, than probably the States, but I may be wrong, is uh, ethyl glucuronide in urine and phosphatidyl ethanol. And they're both specific biomarkers of alcohol uh, metabolism. And um, they're very good in urine. There's a lot of people trying to be measured in ethylglucronide in hair, um, and, but in my view, the data in hair is, is not very good at all, um, and I wouldn't want a court case being defined on it, which is mm. often what happens. So they're, they're various biomarkers. So ethylglucronide in urine remains high for about three days. So you know, if you came to see me and said you had no, and, and I measured your blood alcohol, it was zero. Could measure your urine with a quick runner, and if you'd had a drink three days beforehand, you'd probably be elevated. Okay, and you said earlier on a lot of these numbers fluctuate. Um, is there any general uh, range where if a number fluctuates more than 10% or 30%, well, that may say something, but in general, they fluctuate a certain amount? I, th- I think they probably, most tests will fluctuate by probably 30%. 40%, probably as much as that. It's a good point, actually. How what percentage do they fluctuate? And I would say, I would say probably by even, or, or maybe as high as 50%, but probably 30 or 40% would be in the other the mark. And, and, well, would, and, and a, lot okay. of, a lot of people just get very twitched when they see the Lorenzo's going up, but it's not, it's just natural fluctuation. Mm. What are the main complaints, the symptoms people tell you about that cause them to come see you? Most patients with liver disease, it's asymptomatic. Um, uh, some people may have an ache in the liver if they have fatty liver. Some people may have itching if they have obstruction, like barred obstruction or uh, uh, what we call a cholestatic uh, liver picture, such as primary biliary cholangitis. Um, uh, obviously, some patients may present with jaundice. Um, some people may just present with nausea, malaise. Um, if patients with autoimmune liver disease, which predominantly affects young women or older women, in the young women, they may find their periods go a bit awry. Um, uh, but most of the patients are picked up with abnormal liver function tests on screening or routine testing. Okay. Okay. Then they'll send them to you. Gotcha. Very good. All right. Well, just, just uh, you know, maybe one last question or so. So uh, what other trends are you seeing? You said that uh, fatty liver appears to be on the rise dramatically. Um, any mm. other liver, liver trends? Yeah, and the other thing to note is, is uh, the, the new treatments for hepatitis C have transformed the whole landscape in that they, uh, before, if you go back five years, if you presented with hepatitis C, we'd treat you with pegylated interferon and ribavirin. It would work in about less than 50% of patients. It would give awful side effects. You'd have to have it for a year. You may have to stop work. You'd end up depressed. One patient's wine and ended up in a psychiatric institution, suicidal. It was pretty awful treatment. The new treatments, however, take 12 weeks. They are virtually free of side effects and they cure 95% of all individuals. And they are brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And as a result, you know, our hospital alone has treated, I think, 6,000 patients in the last, I think it's like two years or something, quite, quite a dramatic increase in the number of patients we've treated. So much so that, you know, when we get a patient with hepatitis C, you know, I used to have two or three a week. 
in my clinic, and don't forget, there's lots of us hepatologists at the Royal Free, there's probably about 12 of us, you know, used to have them every week. And and now, you know, probably getting one a month, you know, it's dramatically reduced these numbers of patients. And, it, and not only does it cure them, but for a drug that has so few side effects, they actually feel better. So whereas before with hepatitis C, they had chronic fatigue, uh, they just felt crappy, really crappy. And the new drugs are making them feel better, more energy, much better quality of life. And, they, and it's a transforming landscape, which cures, prevents the progression of disease. If they have cirrhosis, it will partially regress, just like the alcoholic who stops drinking. Um, and it's transformative. And so if any of your listeners have hepatitis C, get yourself treated. And if you can't afford treatment because it's expensive, um, don't feel allowed to say this, but you can buy these drugs on the internet for much cheaper. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. I'll leave that one well, you to broadcast, whether you're allowed to or not. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So what, what's the best way for um, for people to find out more and, uh, you know, to get help if they if they believe they need help? Any general recommendations? And, you know, how can they also find out more about, uh, you know, NHS-related liver uh, treatment? Um, I don't know what I would advise, really. I mean, you know, there'll be liver, there are liver specialists all over the world. And I suppose, like in all professions, they get some that are good and some that are less good. Um, um, I don't think I, I don't think it's an easy way for me to give a general recommendation, um, except to say that that a lot of gastroenterologists, uh, essentially tubular gastroenterologists, they look after the guts and do a bit of liver disease on the side. Whereas other doctors like myself, we just really do liver disease, and I think it's fair to say don't really do any gut stuff on the side at all, just liver. And I think if you have a liver problem, you're better off seeing a liver specialist. Thank you. Okay. Well, Kevin, right. thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. And I assume you'll, you'll once you've done it, you'll send me a link to that so I can you know, make a link to my website yeah. and stuff like that, from my website and all that sort of stuff. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.